Hey guys, hello! I believe it's time for the opening that probably most of you asked me for uh, so far. And it's the Max Lang attack. Max Lang attack is a very interesting line. I have to be honest that uh, I used to teach my students this opening a long time ago, like probably 15 years ago. For some reason, not anymore. But thank you so much for asking so much and thank you so much for requesting this line because I believe it's still great. Uh, unlike other videos, I have to reveal a secret here. Uh, I definitely, uh, and I have to admit that I checked like even two videos uh, on the web about this attack. I just wanted to see how do they do these lectures, how do they do these uh, openings online. I was pretty, pretty satisfied with most of this stuff, uh, except one thing. In one extremely popular video about this uh, opening, the guy said everything about this line except the most critical and the main line. So we'll change that. And uh, actually, that's why I'm here to even go deeper at that part and to uh, give you some secrets and novelties of mine. During the lecture, you'll be able to see only game of mine. I only played one game in this opening in the past. It was like when I was like around like 20 years old, maybe a little bit older. Uh, and uh, you'll be able to see two games of one of my best students ever, uh, Chess Bra Guy, Eric Hansen, Grandmaster, famous guy who's playing online. Uh, he won both of these games in like 20 moves, actually even le uh, uh, lesser than that. So get ready, fasten your seat belts, and it's time for this uh, really nice attack. It can happen from two order of moves, and this is just like uh, what we cover in our series of openings. Bishop c4 that starts like an Italian opening, and when they play knight f6, which goes into the three knights opening. Here I'm intending to teach you uh, three different things. I'm intending to teach you a fried lever attack. In this lesson I'm gonna teach you a max lang attack, but I also have to show you as a part of this max lang attack when they take on d4 because they have to. You play castle and here uh, there is like a crossroad and two moves. Bishop c5 leads to max lang attack and knight e4 leads to two knights scotch gambit. Uh, here I have two interesting lines to show you. I'm gonna show like the main line of the two knights scotch gambit with rookie one, but I'm also going to show you like uh, Nekmes and gambit, a very very inspiring one with a white pieces where white just sacrifices two pieces at once for like almost unstoppable mating attack. Uh, anyways, in this lesson I'm just going to teach you look, bishop c5. After bishop c5 you play e5. In all those weeds um, on YouTube that I found about this attack, uh, they didn't cover what if they play side lines. They just covered the best line with d5. Well, most of you, I know that very well, are not like top players and you won't like face all the time top moves, right? So we just have to see what happens if they play knight d4, knight g4, if they have, if they play knight h5, and if they play knight g8. Let's get started. If they play knight g4, at the moment they threaten to win the second pawn and probably win the game. We play bishop f4, defend this pawn, and threaten this knight on g4. After they play castle, because they have to, otherwise we threaten bishop f7 followed by knight g5, uh, breaking the castle and winning this knight back and just getting the material back, or even immediate knight g5, they gotta go with castles. And when they go with castles, absolutely the easiest way to get the advantage is h3, uh, knight h6, and you take on h6. You don't have to play this way, but I actually like it so much because it gives white a way better uh, game because of nice initiative. You just break in the center with c3 and knight c3. Let's discuss this position. Yes, we're down a pawn. And yes, they do have a bishop pair. But on the other hand, do they have like a terrible pawn structure? Do they have like a possibly weak king on g8? 
Uh, do they have like lots of problems with development in this game? They definitely have problems with all these things. And just because of this, uh, we just have to uh, we just have to focus on I don't know knight d5, knight e4, knight f6, queen d2 followed by queen h6. Uh, there are like so many plans, and what is almost uh, close to uh, say that he's 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 around the around winning position. Instead of knight g4, there is also move knight e4. It's a very common approach by black players here, especially when the bishop is not on c5, so they can bring this knight back. In this case, it does not work. Whenever this knight early jumps on e4, you always have this killer move bishop d5. It goes after the knight. Knight has nowhere to go but to be defended by f5. Well, if you play f5, now it has just opened up the light square bishop. You can't make castle uh, till the rest of the game. And the easiest way to get the advantage is knight e2. After you capture, we capture by bishop. You've got lots of problems with development. I'm threatening knight g5, queen h5, rook e1. Even bishop g5 could be an idea. But just like I told you previously, probably uh, the most important thing in this a position is the fact that you can't make castle for the rest of the game. So that makes this position being so special. Uh, third move is after e5 if they play knight h5. Knight is on the rim of the board. We gotta take advantage of it and we play knight g5. Queen threatens to take the knight and we're about to win the f7 pawn. They should resign. And finally, they can play knight g8. If they play knight g8, well, I just have a question. Why did you play knight f6 uh, to uh, be forced to play knight g8? Afterwards, uh, you just go knight g5, threatening this pawn on f uh, f7. They have to play uh, knight h6 to defend on f7, but now they have problems with the knight on h6. Rook e1. And this is the game of mine that I had here. Uh, the game play was played in... Uh, I played some uh, scholar championship like, uh, I don't know, for like uh, high schools like uh, that was like almost 20 years ago, actually even more than that. And I remember that I was impressed with most of the analysis about this opening. I played rookie one to defend the pawn. And I was hoping that my opponent would make this typical and uh, very crucial mistake, castle. So guess how did I win this? I played... Uh, not that uh, common and not that expected idea here. I played queen to d3. I threatened the checkmate in one move. So I'm threatening queen takes h7. The guy played g6. I went with my queen on h3 with a tempo. So look at this. I'm threatening this knight. And if they move the knight, I'm mating on h7. The guy played king g7. And I remember my hands were shaking when I had to play that, but I played queen h6. At the same time, I was like very confident when I played queen h6, but at the same time, I was a little bit uncertain, like, you know, you're young and you're just playing against somebody uh, who, who was considered to be your rival in that uh, championship and in tournament. I sacked the queen, took on f7, the guy played king g7, played bishop h6 with a tempo, I played knight d8, giving check to the king, and when the king went to h8, I played knight f7, and he resigned the game. I was uh, completely winning here, uh, just like you see, uh, I'm up a piece, and not just that, I'm just going to be even more after this move, because they have to give up this rook on f7, and just because of this, he resigned. So this is the only game that I ever played in this max line attack, uh, but let me just show you uh, the real stuff now, and I believe you should be very happy. Uh, there is like one thing about uh, uh, this this attack. So after e5, d5, that's the only move, and in theory it's considered to be the only move for black. You play e takes f6 and d takes c4. I, I, I want to stop here, because this position uh, goes into two different type of options for white. I opted for a more attractive one, and the one that you're going to definitely enjoy more. It's a uh, rookie one check. But for all of you who are like really big lovers 
of this position and you want to use it like on regular basis not just one game to surprise your opponents and keep in mind if Grandmaster Hansen could could have used like two times this opening in the past and won both of games in 15 20 moves then you can use this opening as well and by the way at the time when Eric played that he was like 24 80 uh, Fide uh, after like D takes C4 uh, rookie one is one option, but I just want to give you an alternative option uh, for you who intend to play this line for a long time and not just for one game. It's F takes G7. After like rook G8, then you give check and they gotta go with bishop E6. When they go bishop E6, you play bishop G5, bishop E7. If queen D7, you play knight Bd2, knight E4, knight F6. So they gotta go bishop e7. I'm showing you the best line for both sides. Bishop e7. And then you play knight takes d4. Uh, this position in practice is considered to be slightly but a long term better for white. It's not a huge advantage, uh, but it's very important to know that you always can go for a less attractive position where you definitely have like slightly better game. Uh, why? Because if they play long castle, you take on c6, because the queen on uh, e7 is hanging. They have to take on c6 and you play queen f3. Look at this terrible pawn structure for black players. Uh, when they take on g7, you just go with knight c3. If they go bishop d5, you just take on e7 and play knight c3. And uh, you here, you play g3 to defend, play rook c1, and you have to know that in theory this position is considered to be much better for white. I, I won't analyze this one. I'm just giving you, like just like I told you, an alternative option and to be happy to have like two different lines, an attractive one full of sacrifices and this one which is like more sound and solid. But no, the real thing comes to a rookie one a line. Why do I like uh, the fact that you reminded me of this uh, Max Lang attack in this opening so much? First of all, uh, you're reminding me of the fact that I can still teach my students this opening. Also, of the fact that Hansen won two games at the time when I was coaching him. And finally, that I won one nice game. But more importantly, when I checked the main line, I couldn't find an equality for black. That's even more important. Today is like 15th of July when I'm making this video. And by the way, you're going to be able to see it live uh, in two days. But you know what? I really see lots of problems for black how to deal with this opening. What I like even more about this uh, attack is that they have to play literally all only and really, really uh, top moves in order to not, not to lose very easily. So that's what I like. I like, like the tricky side of this opening. And... Uh, this is like recommendation for all of you. Let's go, guys. So after rookie one, they have to play bishop e6. I've seen Max Lang himself, uh, the guy who's like inventor of this opening, played a couple of games uh, back to 80-60s uh, like this. In both of these games, he took on g7 and played knight e5. Nowadays, I'm going to show you the game of Pavel Ponkratov, Highest rated GM who still plays this opening with white pieces. <coughs> he played knight bd2. The idea of knight bd2 is to go with this knight on e4 and to go for the attack, but also you can just win the pawn on c4 in case you're happy to win it. I'm not happy to win the pawn back. I'm actually happy to make that. I'm showing the game between uh, Ponkratov and his opponent who, who's also a GM around 2500. So this guy played, uh, by the way, if g takes f6, look at this. You play knight e4, threatening both, bishop and pawn. Bishop goes back naturally. Bishop h6, check and queen d2. You want to play queen f4. I found one guy uh, who in this game played like bishop f5. Like, let me get my bishop around the king so everything to be proper and well defended. Well, queen f4 threatens the bishop, threatens... Uh, something else. If bishop e4, rook e4, they can't stop mating pattern with the queen g3. If they play bishop g6, uh, guys, 
I'm giving you like five seconds. Of course, pause the video and find it. Knight f6, rook e8, double exclam mark move, queen f6, and they can't stop mater, they're losing queen. And finally, after queen d2, knight e5, you go with queen f4, they go knight g6. One might say, well, I'm once again defending myself properly, so where is mate? Once again, pause the video and practice tactics. Knight f6, bishop f6, queen f6, baby, sacrifice the queen, threaten checkmate, and then da 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 da, checkmate. So I very much like this tactics regarding the second f6, and even double like uh, sacrifice with a rook on e8 in order to deflect that queen from the defense of the f6 pawn. Pavel Pankratov and Sinkevich uh, in the game was like queen d5. Pankratov played knight e4, threatening both. Knight takes c5 to win the dark square bishop, to win the control of, uh, on, on the dark squares. The guy played bishop f5, f takes g7, and Pankratov played a move of the game. Pause the video and find it. Once again, double exclaim mark move. Bishop h6. This is what I'm telling you. Uh, you gotta have a great memory and to really be uh, like cutting edge prepared for this opening if you want to use it. On the other hand, if Hansen, if I used it, if Ponkratov and all these GMs, Shulskis, whose name we heard like a couple of times in our weeds, uh, then you can beat your opponents as well. Just make sure to learn these analysis or just to ask Big Maya to buy these files. So, after bishop h6, queen h6, queen d2, king g7, queen g5. You can't cover yourself with the bishop. You go king f8, Pankratov played here. You can't go here because of knight f6, it's a nice mating pattern. Went with a king on e7, queen h4, it's a nice check. Queen h6 again, uh, just checking his pulse and giving him like... Um, a fake hope that he won't be able to see the win. And after knight c5, bishop e6, boom, black resigned. Just like you see, this was a great game by a guy who's rated 2600. The game was played in Russia six years ago, and I hope you enjoy. And finally, after king f8, knight bd2, they're pretty much aware of the fact that the knight goes and tends to jump on e4. And that we want to win this pawn on c4, so they pin this knight with the bishop before. Looks like, wow, what are we going to do? Don't panic. a3. They gotta give it up. You take, and they go bishop g4. I want to show you uh, one nice analysis here. If the queen takes f6, pause the video and find the nice tactics that absolutely breaks all uh, black defensive hopes. Knight takes d4. If queen takes d4, bishop e4, they can't take because the queen is fallen. If you move the king, then checkmate. So just like you see, the same thing happens if the knight takes d4, you just give check, and after this, it's checkmate. They simply, after knight e4, have to uh, uh, call it a day. So in order not to lose so easily, they have to pin now this knight. So they pin one knight with the previously dark square bishop, and now they do with this uh, with this one. I'm showing you email game, so correspondence game. You know how much I like them because they are absolutely checked and uh, like with the top analysis and without mistakes. So look at this. Played h3. Of course, you don't want to take and go into the end game because it's terrible. Uh, I mean, look at this. If you just go into something like this. I believe you're easily gonna get mated after this and just work to e4 and you threaten this one and not just that, you can double up uh, your rooks and mate on the e-file. By the way, if they play f5, just move your rook somewhere on the e-file and mate them. So it's, it's not a problem. So that's why bishop h5. You play bishop g5. You threaten this covered check to win the queen. They gotta go g takes f6. You give check, they go king g8. And there we go. Uh, the game ended in the next move. Pause the video. Once again, not exclaim mark move. Two exclaim mark moves. Knight takes d4. You threaten to win this bishop. And you basically give up the queen. So when they take the queen, you take on c6. B takes c6. 
and when they play b takes c6, you play rook a d1. They gotta go with queen c8, and boom, rook to e3. They can't stop checkmate, or they can't stop like doubling up the rooks with the mate. When when is that uh, especially important? If they play queen f5 to stop like, uh, sorry, if they play queen f5 to stop mate with rook g3, then you double up these rooks, threatening mate. And if they say, aha, uh -huh, you won't mate me, and then you say, huh, yeah, baby, but now I'm gonna go from another side. So that's how it works in this position. And just because of this, after a check, they have to play bishop e6. You play knight g5. Obviously, you threaten to take on e6 and to play queen h5, winning the bishop on c5. Showing you the game of Eric Hansen. The game was played against a guy who's rated like 2100. So pretty good player. Uh, after queen f6, Eric took on e6. Dum -da -da -dum -dum. Queen h5, say goodbye to your bishop. And Hansen's opponent resigned. So he won the game in 11 moves. What, what else do you want, guys? 11 moves. So after knight g5, if they don't play queen f6, if they play like queen d6, you take on e6, f takes e6, f takes g7, check, and when they go like king d8, you go queen f7, the rook is fallen. If they go king e7, you give check and the rook is falling after queen f7. And finally, if they play king d7, you just go knight e2, followed by knight e4, threatening knight e4, knight f6, and they're completely lost. When you play knight g5, they can't play queen d7 either, because you take on g7 first, you take on e6, and you say, boom, queen h5, say goodbye to bishop on c5. And finally, castle. Uh, I found so many games in the database play like this because they think, okay, somehow I'll be able to defend myself after castle. After f takes g7, king g7, there is a nice symmetry here. Rook takes e6 because they can't capture, because they're going to lose after knight e6 fork and we're about to win the queen. I did put like the red color on the bishop. No, we were not going to take it, but uh, basically they're just like completely lost. That means that I have to play queen d5. When they play queen d5, we play another attractive move because look, they just need to make a long castle and they're, you know, like saved. They don't have problems anymore and they can just say, okay, dream on about like nice mating attacks and uh, everything else. I'm just gonna make castle and I ran away. So you just have to play a very special oh mosquitoes uh, so you're just gonna play like a very special move here knight c3 what's so special about knight c3 you can't take this uh, knight because of queen d5 and the king is pinned and they have to play queen f5 somebody asked me uh, in one of those lessons in the past why not queen d7 oh well uh, you can't take on e6, play queen h5 and take on c5 because eventually your knight on c3 is gonna be hanging. So you play knight c on e4. You threaten this bishop. When they move the bishop away to b6, if they go bishop f8, you just take and you play knight c5. Very nice way. Now you deflected that bishop from controlling the dark squares and now you take advantage of that. One of the knights is gonna take on e6 and then you'll take advantage of the weak king on e8. The knight c4, bishop e6. You take on g7, and a rook is hanging. They can't play rook g8, they can't castle, and at the same time you threaten to jump knight f6, winning the queen. They have to go after knight c3, queen f5. It's practically the only move. Uh, they also want to solidify their position, uh, once again, don't forget, if they make castle, pack your stuff, go home, live this game and say, okay, this is not for me. So that's why you have to be very precise here. Knight c on e4. What are you threatening? To take on g7? To play g4, in which case you would deflect the queen and win the piece. They have to play castle according to the latest analysis in the theory. In case they go with castle, well-known tricks. Take on g7, take on c5, boom, rook takes c6, 
using the symmetry. If they play bishop f8, you take on f7, play knight g5, take on e6, and play knight f8. Of all the variations that I found about this line, I realized that this line is one of, one of the most solid continuations by black in practice. Uh, I'm not saying this is good. It's actually much better for white, even according to the uh, strongest tangents. But I just need to, needed to show you like uh, what is used by pretty solid players in the past. Of course, white is much better. First of all, king on g8 is weak. Secondly, um, you're not even down material. f6 is going to fold just like the pawn on d3 or b7 afterwards. And also, the uh, the game is open. We got a bishop in an open game and the pawns are on both sides. So all conditions are fulfilled to say we're just so much better. After knight e4, they go long castles. We go g4. A very nice move. We're using deflection again. If the queen takes, uh, we would take. And now... Uh, you can just take on c5 or take on f7. I would probably first take on f7 because everything uh, is about to drop in a black's game. If on g4 they play queen g6, you take on e6 and you take on g7, uh, taking afterwards rook on a8 or uh, bishop on c5. If they play queen d5, well, man, you just brought the queen back onto the place where it's where it used to be. So we take on g7 and play knight f6 winning like this they gotta go with this move and this is interesting in all those wits that i checked about this gambit they usually stopped here they didn't know how to continue they didn't know what to do here or they were like very uncertain about like the continuations from from now on uh you have to take on e6 that's the best move and that's what makes this line being so special they can take by queen because knight c5, first take on g7 and then take on c5 and you're just winning. After f takes e6, you take on g7. You take advantage of the fact that they can't take on g7 because still bishop on c5 is hanging. They gotta go with rook, age, uh, with rook age to g8. And the special and only move for white to claim uh, the advantage is bishop h6. You open up the back rank, which is like very important to connect your pieces. Uh, you defend like your main hope in this game. It's the pawn on g7. And probably most importantly, uh, you just somehow solidify your game. Because it looks a little bit scary when you have this pawn on g4 and potentially we king on g1. Don't worry, it's not the end of the world. Uh, in all the games that I found, uh, most of these guys... I even found how Capablanca got beaten by somebody here. All these guys play d3. Bishop e7 is not enough because of queen f3. Queen f3 uh, for sure gives white slightly better middle game. And always keep in mind that the pawn on g7 is now like a soul of your game. And it's your main hope here. Uh, after bishop h6, everybody went for d3. Uh, c3 is the move. And you want to take on c5, going into a pure middle game where the bishop uh, is way better than knight. Or you want to go uh, with uh, queen f3. After they play d2, rook to e2 is the move. And now even Capablanca played like many years ago, uh, rook d3. Supporting the pawn on d2, moving around the king, threatening even rook h3. Everything looks so scary about this. So look at this. He threatens rook h3 to win the game at once. h2 is hanging just like the bishop on h6. Also, he supports the pawn on d2. And uh, looks, you know, if, if you just ask me just at first glance to assess this position, I would say, wow. I'm not sure what's happening here, but if I had to take some, some pieces that surely uh, would, be, would be black. But you know, that's a problem of superficial assessing of the games. Queen f1 is the specialty. You stop rook h3 by black. You want to go with a rook d1 to go after the d2 pawn. And most likely, you want to play h3 solidifying yourself with the king g2 and slowly but surely... Uh, taking like all kinds of measures to uh, somehow reposition or regroup your pieces and defend yourself properly. I'll show you like two games 
uh, main line is queen d5. If knight e7, which is bad, you play rook to d1, I already explained you that's your plan. You take on c5 first always, because you always should be happy to play bishop against knight. Your bishop is a dominating piece, especially as long as you have uh, this uh, pawn on g7. And you know what? Now in all those games, I found uh, that, uh, actually found in two games, not all those games, 95 looks scary. For example, if somebody plays just like that, I would be, you know, like uh, pretty much scared that he's going to find something. No, you take on d3, you play like h3 and everything is solid. Queen d5 still looks scary, but then you have this very nice defensive resource. When they play knight f3, you go with the king f2 and they're completely lost. d3 is about to fall. Knight on f3 uh, has no space. Pawn on g7 still remains as our main hope and uh, they, they should resign here. In one correspondence game after queen f1, I found that the guy wanted to keep this bishop on b6. Well, this looks fine. And after rook to d1, you want to get this pawn on d2, rook g7. After rook g7, took on g7, played queen g2, and after knight e5, played rook to d2. What is this? This is just a technical part of the game where white eventually managed to win the game. You're up in exchange. They absolutely don't have a, a single thing to claim that they can have an advantage because we pretty much solidified ourselves in terms of defense, and this looks good. And finally, after queen f1, queen d5. What is so special about queen d5? Well, very obvious. Uh, they want to uh, they want to push the pawn and promote the queen. You take. You take and threaten special move here queen g2. I like it so much because now you're happy to go into the end game because our main hope and soul of the game pawn on g7 is about to be promoted. It's going to be queen. So after bishop e7 we go queen g2. And not that we only uh, like properly and you know like very strongly defend our king and the king side but we also with any kind of a queen exchange weaken both pawns on c4 and e6 if they take look at this these are terrible pawns while the pawn on uh, g7 uh, remains like the strongest piece uh, also i can afterwards easily start pushing these pawns and take advantage even of that fact so, after queen g2, in one uh, game was bishop f6, the guy played queen e4, I like it so much, because he points out the weakness of c4, e6, h7. Everything is about to be winning. He took on g7, queen h7, he played knight a7 desperately, and after bishop g7, resigned the game. I hope you enjoyed this uh, Max Lang attack uh, video and lecture. Uh, I'm pretty sure... I, I'm not uh, hoping right now. I'm pretty sure you're going to have like uh, lots of good results with this uh, attack in this opening in the future. And uh, this is one of the uh, most likable videos uh, I've made so far. I'm, I'm absolutely sure it's going to be very popular. Uh, guys, see you very soon. Bye-bye.